Welcome in to another edition of the Five Reasons Podcast. My name is Chris Whittingham, joined as always by Ethan Skolnick. You found our Sunday football recap episode that we try and get up each and every weekend ready for your Monday commute. Do subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts on Spotify as well. Check out the other podcasts in the Five Reasons Sports Network if you're here for football. Be sure to check out Three Yards Per Carry on the Dolphins, Five Rings on the Canes, and The Fish Tank, which is a terrific story telling Dolphin stories from years past. I'm live here from Hard Rock Stadium at one of the radio booths here in the stadium. I was covering the game, hosting the pregame and halftime show, and watching the Dolphins lose today again at the hands of the Detroit Lions by a score of 29, or 32, I'm sorry, I forgot that late field goal, 32 to 21. And Ethan, let's go to get started with our five points on the game. You'd have to begin with the defense. Normally, uh, this is a team that gets viewed through the prism of Ryan Tannehill. I thought uh, for the opening few weeks of the season that the defense was a legitimate strength. And if you were to say, I think a lot of people are asking, are the Dolphins actually good, right? Is this team actually a contender, a team that can do something well? And I would have said defense, but now the defense is, I would say, turned in a couple of bad defensive performances in a row. They weren't great against Oakland. They weren't great against New England. Uh, they weren't great against Chicago in the second half after a great first half. Uh, defense is now a problem for this team. If you were to say this Detroit Lions offense only punted the ball once today, uh, went in sort of the balance of play, uh, it ran out the clock on, on the final possession of the game. What is the biggest thing that you would say right now is wrong with this defense? Well, the biggest thing is the linebacker play to me. Um, and we're going to touch on some other things, but I mean, the linebacker play is just not good enough. And I, I know Kiko Alonso has been good this year. Um, the problem is if Kiko Alonso is your best linebacker, you've got a problem with your linebacking core. And, and I know they lost Chase Allen uh, for the season, and that was someone they were counting on to be part of their rotation. But it's just pretty clear right now that Raekwon McMillan and Jerome Baker are not ready for this. And McMillan, I you know, I consider McMillan, McMillan a rookie because he didn't really play, well, he didn't play at all in any games during his rookie season. He was there for camp. Um, but he looked overmatched today. He looked overmatched in coverage. He was overmatched on that running play uh, by the end zone where he just got wham blocked, basically couldn't get off the block. He's having trouble getting off the blocks. He's having trouble in coverage. We've seen that numerous times. I know Baker, Baker did an interview with WSVN after, so I guess he's okay. He got hurt at the end of the game. They're very, very thin at that position and they just don't make enough plays. And look, this is not a one year issue. Um, I did something for Dolphin Maven during the game. Cause I was kind of trying to think back. I'm like, you know, what's the last real success story they've had in terms of drafting a linebacker since drafting Zach Thomas in the fifth round in 1996, 1996, which is about the time that half the hosts in my, in our network, I shouldn't say my <laughs> network. I sound like Sean Carlo Navas in our, in our network were born okay 1996 they drafted zach in the in the fifth round since then they've drafted 26 linebackers which actually isn't that much other teams have drafted more they've drafted 26 linebackers uh and guys like uh, like Le Le curtis jones and brad jackson and other guys like that okay eddie moore of course everyone remembers eddie moore you know how many pro bowlers those 26 guys have made how many none wow no pro bowlers uh, That's crazy. In, in that entire group. Now, they've had some group guys who've played some games. Uh, you do a lot of hosting with Channing, and Channing played 82. I will not have his name slandered on this program. No, and, and look, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the rea I love Channing. You know that. The reality is, um, and Channing decided to, to retire, basically. Um, I mean, he wasn't pushed out of the game. But if you look at Derek Rogers played 116. Moreland Greenwood played 105. Channing played 82. Koa Misi played 84. But how many big plays do you remember from those four guys? And those were the best, deal. right? Those were the best four. The the only other one that they they drafted that turned out really productive was Olivier Vernon, but his productivity didn't come at linebacker. His productivity came at defensive end, and and he never ended up actually making a Pro Bowl. So they've just they've missed, and, and this is many many regimes, okay, that have missed at that position. Whereas, like, if you look at like what the Patriots have done at linebacker, what the Steelers have done at linebacker. Uh, some of these other teams with the Broncos have done at linebacker and you compare it to what the Dolphins have done. They just have never treated the position seriously enough and they haven't hit on enough players. And that to me is coming to roost right now because I don't think that McMillan and Baker are necessarily lost causes, but they're clearly not ready for this. 
and the linebacker play is killing everything because it's a soft middle of the defense. They can't really blitz those guys. They don't get anything effective from them. And something else we're going to talk about is the pass rush in general, which has been problematic. Um, but as long as that group is subpar, they're never going to be a consistent defense, Chris. Like th- they'll have moments because I, they're I, to me, they're two best players on the defense right now are playing, you know, in the, on the back end and well, three best players. I think actually Fitzpatrick, Rashad Jones and Xavier Howard are the three best defensive players right now. And they're all in the back end. But as long as the linebacker position is not good, you can't count on them from week to week. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Uh, to me, if, if I was to kind of nail something down, I, I'm just frustrated with both in this game and in the new England game, that they didn't just pick something. Pick stopping the run. Pick stopping the pass. Put numbers in the secondary and make sure that Matthew Stafford can't get rolling or blitz him so that he can't get comfortable in the pocket. Don't allow Carryon Johnson to do you know, something incredible. His best performance as a rookie, I think he's going to be a really good player, but my God, some of the missed tackles, there was four on one play where, where he gets double-digit yards. Like, take something away. Like that's it, it, And I, I know in, in football we lean on this too much, but... Ask yourself, what would Belichick do? What would Belichick? He would take something away, and and the Dolphins just did nothing to take something away today. The the Lions did whatever they want. They only punted once, and it was you know because Jerome Baker went in untouched on a blitz and was able to bat a ball down. But other than that, it was just gain, big gain after big gain. I'd I'd love to research the number of double digit gains that they had today. I I maybe can do it quickly, but my God, there were just so many in the game, and my frustration. I'm I'm not going to necessarily have a go at Matt Burke, but I, I, at a certain point you have to take something away because in, in New England it was the same thing. Tom Brady picked the Dolphins apart, I would say, maybe after the halfway mark of the first quarter of the second quarter, and Sony Michelle got off. You've basically been gashed by two rookie running backs this year, and they've just they've done nothing to take them away. Um, something that you want to hit on as we move on to point two, and you're absolutely right about this, and I, I feel like it's kind of gone undercovered because there's been so many injuries at that position that I almost feel like we've been making an excuse for them, but they're getting no pass rush right now, putting no, no pressure nothing. on Matthew Stafford whatsoever again today, and I, I can check where they are in the league in sacks, but I don't remember very many sacks. I don't remember very much pass rush where, like, if Pro Football Focus was sent out, yeah, they only got one sack, but they had, you know, ten hurries and nine quarterback hits. But, okay, they're getting pressure, but you don't even remember much of that. They're just getting nothing up the middle, off blitzes, off pa- off the ends. And, frankly, let's just go ahead and say it. this is a defense that is entirely reliant on generating turnovers, and when they don't, it looks like today. Yeah, it does. And, look, you mentioned it. Um, there are four primary defensive ends, and I know we're not seeing Charles Harris right now. But their four primary defensive ends have three sacks between them. Um, yep. You know, Cameron Wake, Robert Quinn, uh, Branch, who did have a play today, uh, and Harris, who they've got nothing out of this season, which is another problem we've kind of discussed as we move to the offense, start talking about some of these first-round picks. But, uh, yeah, they're just not getting past rush. And, look, that was supposed to be when we talked about it. Why? It, how can this defense overcome its issues at the linebacker position? Well, it can overcome it with a really good back end, uh, with Howard, McCain, and Fitzpatrick, and Rashad Jones, and with the pressure you know, coming from the corners, basically, on the defensive line. And that just has not materialized. And I don't know with Cam Wake. You know, I, he, he, you know, Gase made kind of a cryptic statement in his press conference that guys told him they were ready to play. I saw Cam you know, said at his press conference that he felt good physically. He just didn't do much. Um, and, so, and hasn't they, done much. He hasn't done much. There was one game where he flashed. There's been two games where Robert Quinn flashed, but this has to be the strength of this defense, and it just hasn't been. And if it's not going to be, then again, quarterbacks start to get comfortable, and it's very easy to isolate your backs, uh, your tight ends, or even your slot receivers on the Dolphins linebackers and make hay there, and that's kind of what's happening. So they need to get pressure from those guys on the outside. They're paying those guys a ton of money. I mean, even, even Branch... And I, look, I, you know, we've talked about some of the injuries. They obviously miss William Hayes against the run. I, I think that's pretty clear at this stage. Uh, he was an underrated player, and his absence, I think, has also been sort of not talked about quite as much as it should be. But your best players need to play big, and they need to play big at home. And the Dolphins have been a good home offensive team, and I thought they had the makings, as we transition to that in a minute, of a pretty decent offensive game today where they could have been close. I mean, look, they've averaged about 28 points at home under Gase, okay? Um, And so I thought they were heading that direction, uh, but they just didn't have the ball enough, and they didn't have the ball enough because the defense not only did not generate pass rush, not only had trouble getting off the field again, not only could not tackle, which, as you talked about, was a major issue, but also – 
didn't have takeaways today. And that's that has, as you and I have talked about, has kind of saved them in some games, right? Like, yep. the, you know, the plays in the end zone, the Xavier Howard picks. I mean, the only play that we're really talking about, Xavier Howard, I, I thought got beat a couple times today. He was not bad, but he wasn't at his best. Uh, to me, the call at the end was questionable. Um, not quite, uh, not quite Ronnie Magruder on Kemba Walker questionable, <laughs> but 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 it but it was questionable at the end. I mean, I thought he had pretty decent coverage there. I thought you, Xavier should be at the point now with the with the officials where he's known as an elite corner or pretty close to it and should get the benefit of the doubt there against a receiver who does not have a big pedigree. So I was a little surprised that that call was made in that situation, just as I was again surprised for an opposite reason that the Magruder call was made, um, you know, against Kemba, but see, that was different because in that case you had kind of, you know, what's considered an average NBA player guarding a star. And in this case you had a star, covering an average NFL player. And I thought in that case, Howard gets the benefit of the doubt, but he didn't. Um, but if you don't have pass rush, then it makes it harder for those guys um, on the outside. And I didn't think the guys on the outside were terrible today, but they didn't make any plays the way that they've made plays in previous games. And as you said, they just couldn't get off the field. I mean, the only reason the score wasn't worse was because the Lions held the ball for so long on their yep. drive. Uh, I mean, they were somewhat methodical on a lot of their drives, even with the big plays. And so uh, there were I, I would have to check the numbers as compared to past games. But there were fewer possessions and drives in this game than there have been in other games, I think, definitely than the, than the Bears game. And so otherwise, the score would be worse. I mean, it would be worse than 32 points. Um, and so I, look, I, all of this just speaks to this. You and I have discussed this many times. This team on offense is a work in progress in a lot of ways, and now they're getting hit by injuries, okay, big time. Not even and get destroyed by injuries. Destroy, destroyed. And so now, so the defense has to play well, particularly when you had two of your key guys in Wake and McCain coming back. So you actually were healthier than you were last week, and it didn't make any difference. I, I want to transition with you, though, to the offense. Mm -hmm. Can, can, can I just can I just give a couple stats here in terms of uh, to illustrate your point on the defense? Uh, Lions had the ball for 33 minutes and 39 seconds, but you're right. This was a much shorter game in terms of plays. Detroit only ran 58, and Miami only ran 54. Miami ran 75. Even understanding that it was overtime, they ran 75 plays a week ago and 54 today, and that's just a virtue of Detroit. Uh, six uh, six minutes 31 seconds, six minutes 28 seconds, three minutes 50 seconds, four minutes, four minutes five seconds. Like it was a, a constant drum beat of never being able to get off the field never being able to get off the field and then uh, again the missed tackles and all of that stuff um just too much of it and and so we'll see as we as we transition ahead to thursday they're playing a very different kind of team mm -hmm. but in a short week and cam wake kept talking today at the podium he's like look this is wednesday and and he's right okay in terms of the nfl week this was a wednesday going up against a sunday and in other words you have basically three days to prepare you don't get the normal break. They're not even really going to look at this film. Like, they don't have time. Okay, yeah. so they're going to throw this one away and start looking ahead to Houston. But the question is, how many bodies do they have? We'll get back to the podcast here in a second. I first want to tell you about BetDSI.com. You can follow them on Twitter at BetDSI or just go to the website and use the promo code REASON101. That's no S at the end. REASON101. You will get your initial deposit matched up to $2,500. I can tell you, Chris, that's been useful for me because I did a little bit of losing. And I've got a lot of futures in there, some, some NBA over-unders. So I didn't really have any more cash to play with at the moment. But using the bonus is great. So I've been able to kind of get myself back into play here. Not, you know, so. That's sort of the way I've been going about it. Have you been going about it? I've been going about it by with the, with one piece of advice. Okay, I have a piece of advice for you out there. If you want to get into betting, particularly on football, what I'm looking for is just bets that make no sense. So, for example, the Tennessee Titans today were in London taking on the Los Angeles Chargers, a team that were very hot. They had just had their quarterback sacked 11 times and getting shut out by the Baltimore Ravens. And you know what I did? I bet the Tennessee Titans. You know why? Because football. And that is my piece of advice out there, is that if you think that a bet makes absolutely no sense, and you think, how in the world is a team going to win or cover, bet them. Because your intuition is wrong, because the NFL is the strangest league to gamble on. I have no idea why anyone does it, unless you say, hashtag, because football. So if you want to make bets like that, go to betdsi.com, use the promo code REASON101. All right, the offense. Um, let's go to part three of this, and Brock Osweiler, and... First, let's address the Tannehill situation, Chris. I feel like we need to do this. Sure. Um, 
because I, I don't know what the state secret is at this point. Um, <laughs> a, a, a Adam Gase is being, I'll just say it, intentionally evasive at this stage. Um, they're just, I'm going to get in trouble if I say this, they're just not telling the truth, okay? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's, look, they know he's not playing Thursday night, okay? They've known he's not playing Thursday night in Ryan Tannehill. Uh, it's not happening, okay? Um, and so, you know, this is a question of how his shoulder responds to rest and whether at after the, he gets the rest, whether or not they think he can move forward. And a lot of that will have to do not so much with pain tolerance, but it'll have to do with the velocity that he's throwing with. And we just don't know until that actually happens. And so, you know, we have a prediction in our network from the guy who has predicted the best about all of this. And a lot of it has not just been predictions. It's been actual sources that we've had, which is why we broke the story twice. But Chris Kaufman, CK Parrott, uh, has it's so funny when I'm accrediting CK Parrot with news. So I'll go with I'll go with Chris <laughs> on this. Uh, but he's he's look he, his prediction is that Ryan Tannehill doesn't play for the Dolphins again. Um, mm -hmm. now that seems pretty drastic. But his thought process on that is that the shoulder's not going to respond based on what he's heard, and so they're going to be at a point where you know he's got 18.5 million dollars owed to him after this season. And they're going to make a decision to move on. My prediction, which is even less educated than than CK's, is I think he'll be the Jaguars quarterback next year. I'm just throwing that out <laughs> in the dark because uh, Bortles Bortles was was uh, was was benched, was benched today for what was Cleveland's like six string quarterback last year yeah. in Kessler. Uh, so clearly they're going to move on, and they have an infrastructure in place with their defense. And Ryan can continue to play in warm weather, and if his shoulder gets back to healthy, I that to me makes a lot of sense. So again, that's not news. That's just a uh, you know, me making an idiotic prediction, mm -hmm. but, and Chris, you know, termed his as an idiotic prediction on the three yards per carry pod, but I think it makes a lot of sense. So I do not expect to see Tannehill mm -hmm. Thursday. In what do you mean of the fact that they've listed him as limited in practice? Well, that, that would indicate that he's taking at least one snap. Well, right. I mean, he's out there, right? So he's out there. So we're, we're, we're the league is investigating just to be clear on this. Okay. The league is not investigating based on our reporting, which was about him being, you know, as I said, doubtful for the Bears game. Um, I, perhaps I could have said not likely to play. It's the same thing, but it's not technically an official term. Mm -hmm. They were listening to him as questionable. But where what the league was investigating was the way he was being listed on the practice report, not on the official game injury report. And that has to do with whether he's being listed as limited or full practice. And so they put him down as limited, I guess I, my only thought on that, Chris, and again, this is just shot in the dark, but my only thought on that is that if he does take a snap or two and or is running around a little bit, they don't want to be accused of saying he wasn't out there at all, right? So you, mm -hmm. so you put him down as limited. I mean, a lot of this is stupid gamesmanship that you have to play because the NFL caters to gamblers and fantasy players, okay? <laughs> and that's that's basically where they make their money these days. So, uh, you know, that's that's the sort of the backstory of this, the, the important part of this and what we've tried to focus on rather than is it an AC joint or is it a labrum or is it this or is it that is that he's not playing on Thursday. Um, and I don't necessarily anticipate he's going to play the following week, 10 days later against the jets. I suppose that anything is possible, but based on the reporting that we've done on where his shoulder was in terms of his strength, I'm not anticipating that. So, Let's pivot to Osweiler because he's the guy who is playing right now. And I thought he was fine today. I thought he was fine. I agree. He has, he, he has limitations. They sort of play in a phone booth with him a lot of the time. Although he, I thought the deep ball he threw to Stills was pretty decent. Yeah. Uh, he, he made a beautiful throw, beautiful throw on the, on the touchdown throw where Stills almost killed a security guard <laughs> and, and, and would have that gotten a presidential woman. Or woman, yes, um, and uh, and would have gotten a presidential tweet about kneeling by giving her the football there at the end. Um, I, I I thought he was fine. I thought he was fine. And uh, you know, if he plays like that, that should be good enough to win. Um, he has command of the offense. He didn't make a big mistake. He didn't make any brain dead throws. Okay. Um, he kept a couple of plays alive by kind of shuffling his feet in the pocket. He's never going to be an elite player. He's not a build around player. He looks to me like a competent NFL backup quarterback, and that's better. Honestly, Chris, I'm going to take the hit on this. That's better than I thought he was. Honestly. Agreed. I agree. Uh, so I I'm I'm okay with the way that he played, um, and I don't see any need. Now, with that said, he's not better than Ryan Tannehill. 
people need to stop with that. Tannehill's better than Osweiler. But as some of the guys in our network have made this point, he has better command of the offense at times than Agreed. Tannehill. And, and, and Osweiler was even talking about it after the game, uh, basically saying when Wilson comes off and Gasicki comes off, but then he comes back and then Stills comes off and then he comes back and then goes off again, that you're basically throwing out your five healthy skill guys, which at times look like Nick O'Leary, Frank Gore, Kenyon Drake, uh, Jakeem Grant, and whoever the least injured person was fifth. Like, they, they didn't have enough skill guys, and he basically said, like, I had to play a little backyard football. You go there, and you go there, and you go there. And I, as my, Ryan Tannehill would have done it, but I agree with you. I just, I, I, it's, you know, because of years worth, I guess. And maybe Ryan Tannehill just doesn't have the same feel for the position or whatever the case may be, but you just feel more confident with Osweiler in that situation than you do with Tannehill. Yeah, I do um, at, the, at this point. And you can say that and still not say he's better, <laughs> right? So right, exactly. I, yes. I, I, I'm trying. I'm trying to make that distinction with Dolphin fans. Like, if if all things are equal, I would rather have Ryan Tannehill as the quarterback. Now, not until the end of time, which seems like the Dolphins' plan for the last six years. <laughs> but 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 I, I'd rather have him as quarterback. But for what they're going through right now, Osweiler's not a bad alternative because, like no. you said. He has mastery of the offense. And look, I, I don't like the scenario of him going into Houston in a place where he's going to get hammered with booze because he was such a disappointment there after they gave him all that money. I mean, it, it's literally, it, it really is, Chris, the worst possible situation. You've got, <laughs> I mean, you've got, you're going in to play a hot team, okay? That's, that's mm -hmm. you know, one of what's last four, right? A, a hot, a hot team on a Thursday night when road teams never win or yep. rarely win, okay? And you're going in there with a quarterback that they despise. And uh, with about a zillion injuries. And is, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not good. Oh, <laughs> and I want to add to that. We have a watch party. That's right, and, which means that they're almost certainly losing. I mean, and we're 0-4 in watch parties. <laughs> <laughs> two, two Dolphins losses. One was preseason, but it still counts for us. Uh, one heat loss, the season opener, where Josh Richardson dribbled out of bounds. And, uh, and then the Canes game, where they looked disastrous against LSU. Those have been our four watch parties, and we have one at Township. Great spot, by the way. Um, Las Olas and, and Andrews, and we're going to have great uh, drink specials, and beer specials, so you can basically forget the entire experience. And that's what we're going to try to do for you, because I think I think they're going to get hammered on Thursday night. I I, I, just, I don't like uh, anything that's setting up for them right now. Yep. And, and, and the, the, the other problem beyond the injuries is that the thing that you were counting on, like you said, you got to hang your hat on something as a team. And the thing they were counting on was the fact that their defense would keep them in games. And it hasn't now. And it didn't in the, in the second half against the Bears, and it didn't this week. And the other thing you were counting on was your team speed. And we're going to touch on that now, um, which is Albert Wilson. And, yep. and so now you've lost that. And Drew Rosenhaus, we'll know more probably by the time this pod posts, but Drew Rosenhaus is Albert's agent. Now, Drew doesn't have as many Dolphin players like when he had the whole team about 20 years ago. He doesn't have as many Dolphin players, but he has a handful, tends to know what's going on around the team. Uh, he was on with Steve Shapiro, who we're actually having on our pod this week and on WSVN7, and he said – that Albert um, hurt his leg slash hip, but emphasize the hip. Um, if you look at the way that he planted and then planted again, you can see the hip kind of move out of joint a little bit. Um, hip injuries should be taken seriously, particularly for receivers. We've seen receivers' careers uh, basically end because of hip injuries. Now, I'm not saying anything about this being anything like that bad, but I know that some, some Dolphin fans kind of, Breathe, breathe a sigh of relief when they heard it wasn't the knee necessarily hip injuries are no joke um, yeah. at that position. And so, so that is, that is a concern. And, and now you're also talking Chris about you again, shorter week. Um, so we'll basically, be basically if there was any injury today, there is going, there's no chance that they play on Thursday. There just isn't like if right. you cannot recover in three days, unless you're using elephant tranquilizers, it's just, there, there, there's no way. And so, which they are, by the I way. mean, yeah, I probably, I mean, they're probably players who, who are out there today. Like I, I still think that Andre branch is hurt. Like he, yeah. he was questionable all week, limited all week. And last week plays like three fourths of the snaps. Cause they have no healthy defensive ends. I think Kasicki played hurt today. I think mm -hmm. Kenny Stills played hurt today. I think he, Wake, I think Wake played hurt. And I think McCain yeah. played hurt. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. McCain played her today. No doubt. Yeah. We'll get back to our episode here in a second. I want to tell you about the BetQL app. That's BetQL. You got to check them out. And here's why you would not go and bet on the stock. Let me just start over three, 
two, one. We'll get back to our episode here in a second, but first I want to tell you about Bet. QL, the BetQL app. You can find it for free on Google Play if you're Android or iTunes if you're Apple. And the reason that you need BetQL is because you need information. You don't want to just gamble blind, right? Just on a hunch. I mean, you can do it on occasion, but it's not the smartest play. What you need to find out is what are other people betting on? What direction are they pushing the line? And also, what does BetQL think based on some of their analytics? So, Chris, what have you found on there? So the way they go about it is by making recommendations, giving you all the data that you can possibly have, how much is the is the public betting. So, for example, look at the NBA tonight. We're, we're taping this on a Sunday. Oklahoma City playing host to Sacramento. They're 11-point favorites, and they have the betting is actually slightly favoring Sacramento, so take that in mind. And then, in terms of the line movement, it started at 9.5 in favor of OKC and went all the way to 11 after some of the Sharps hit that bet. Becky Wells still thinks, though, that OKC should be favored by 15. They're recommending Oklahoma City as a two-star play. That's the kind of data they can give you over at BetQL. So download the app, Apple App Store, or on Google Play, BetQL. And so this gets to our next thing here, okay? Because all of these guys are hurt and they're playing. Devontae Parker, according to his agent, is healthy, and he's not, right? Yeah. And Gase, and Gase, after the game said he's not 100%. When has he ever been 100%, well, right? He, so, he, he was also a – he pre- he couched it by saying, well, we've got four guys that we thought were rolling, and we, we wanted to get Kalen Balaj on the field because well, we had that, some well, that things was him in the red zone. No, well, yeah. I mean – no, but hang on a second. So they wanted to get Kalen Balaj on the field because he does – first off, the idea that you want him on the field because he plays special teams. If the, like Devontae Parker being sacrificed for special teams is a damning indictment. But secondarily mm-hmm. – so th- they said they had some things in the red zone for Kalen Balaj. And all of a sudden, so so they line it up, right? They must have repped it in practice. It must have worked. They line it up, and Adam Gates takes a timeout because he didn't like the look of it, and they never went back to it again. Like it was right. Kalen Balaj and the Wildcat, and they were going to motion somebody across, and like and I was like, "Whoa, Kalen Balaj!" And I was like, "Who is that? Who is that at quarterback?" And it was Balaj and the whole thing, and they scrapped it. So, for an idea that you didn't even get to execute in the game and special teams you're not playing Devontae Parker. That, to me, is saying that, one, he's being traded, which if he's going to be traded, then those plans have to be reconsidered now, yes. and you have to hold on to it until after the Thursday night game, or you just don't rate him, and, and you don't want him, but you're going to be forced to play him because uh, b- because you're playing on a Thursday and you've got two receivers hurt out have, of this game. They have nobody else? They have right, nobody exactly. Else they have literally Kenny, nobody else. Because Kenny Stills was injured at the end of the game and they were splitting out Kenyon Drake. Uh, yeah, look um, – The Parker thing, I mean, he has this year, I mean, just to give you some context, uh, he has two catches on four targets. Um, One of the targets was picked. That was the Osweiler throw. Yep. The Bears game. He's got a total of 40 yards. Um, He's been up twice. This idea that was floated on NFL Network and other places, I think Mike Garofalo actually put it out there. Mm -hmm. The Dolphins are looking for a third round pick. Give me a freaking break i mean so, i mean they got they got they got a fourth they got a fourth round pick for a jai okay which then they flipped right for robert quinn but they got a fourth and they took balaj actually right so they yep. so that was um but uh th- so they got a third round pick from who for what yeah for, for a guy who doesn't play like who could possibly talk themselves into that and who requires an extension correct like I, correct. like so so I mean, I was thinking conditional sixth. Like they're not getting a <laughs> conditional. They're, they're, sixth. Not, they're not getting a third round pick for Agreed. Devontae Parker at this stage. And, and and here's the other part of it: if they wanted to get that much for him, you play him today. You don't sit him to rest him so he doesn't get hurt again. He's going to get hurt walking down the stairs. You 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 <laughs> you, you, you you play him today, yeah, so that he shows something and somebody trades for him. So. I don't know if I buy that reporting, frankly. I mean, Garofalo is a great reporter, but that one didn't make any sense to me. Third round pick, seriously? Like that's what Tannenbaum at this stage thinks he's worth. There's no chance he's not playing on a team. And look, I think the Dolphins receivers have all been good in their own way. Okay, I, that's one mm-hmm. of the positions we praise the Dolphins for. Like they got something out of that ridiculous Elante Carew trade that they made because Grant is one of the players that ended up coming back and that sort of convoluted deal that they made. So the fact that they've gotten Grant, I, I've praised them relentlessly for the Wilson-Landry swap. Okay, I liked it at the time, and I love it now, obviously. Um, uh, Amendola has worked out well. We've talked about that. I thought he did, again today, the things that they want him to do. And Kenny Stills, uh, you and I both really like as a player. And so they're, they've done good things at receiver, but let's be honest. I mean, they don't have a pro bowler in that group. and 
and Devontae can't get on the field, and somebody's going to give him a third round pick for that production, There's for no not just that production, for that availability. Okay, exactly. Because as you know, that's what matters more than anything else in the NFL, right? You like you can't make the team from the training tub, like that. I mean, you, and and so they're not now. What do they do now? I think they have to hold on to him. I mean, unless some team is stupid enough mm-hmm. to give them a third round pick, like if you're talking about a conditional sixth, which by the way is what I think it probably would be. Uh, I think you have to hold him because, like you said, I don't know that Wilson's going to be ready for Thursday. It certainly didn't look like it. I don't know the severity of Stills' situation. Uh, the guys that they have on the practice squad, they were both willing to they were let, willing to let those guys go. But they still have Carew and Ford there. I, so, mm-hmm. I mean, if, and no team has claimed either of them. Um, so they don't have a lot of options unless they're going to use – I don't know, unless they're going to use Drake split out a lot of the time and actually play Bellage, which I mm-hmm. guess is something that they could do. I mean, I, I, get, I mean, like, if you had a healthy Gasicki, you'd be in two tight end the whole game, and maybe you he see doesn't AJ... like to, He doesn't like to use two tight ends. CK's talked about that. Yeah. Gase, but I, I'm, just, I'm just saying like purely out of necessity, which, I mean, they, they, right. did it, they did it in that fourth quarter. I mean, I, I, I would actually... I, I might do this as a thought exercise. Just go back uh, and watch the fourth quarter, only writing down the personnel that they use at the positions in which they use them. Because three I yards imagine... per carry has already done it. I, I <laughs> oh, oh, have they really? Oh uh, no, I, I'm just, I just know they have. Like I, <laughs> right. I, I, I don't need, I, I don't need you to text them. I mean, Alfredo does that like with his eyes during the game, and then <laughs> afterwards, like that, they're they're savants when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. But you're right. Look, uh, they probably. I mean, I. It's funny. I as much football as I've watched for the last twenty something years covering it, I, I, I can never pick up on that stuff right away i just yeah. i can't and these guys i don't know how they do it but they do it you know, I mean, the they, only thing i notice is when like kalen balaj is at quarterback and i go why is kalen balaj at quarterback well that one <laughs> sticks out yes that's when you like you said you work on a play all week and then you decide ah, nah, we don't really yeah, like uh, it. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's gonna work <laughs> maybe we should have had parker up uh yeah so uh i, I mean and, and let's get to one more point on gase here before we sure. move to this week is um, they're, they've now gone 17 straight opening drives without a touchdown. Um, they went three and out today. Uh, run, I believe it was run sack run, which was interesting uh, with Drake. So then they've gone 17 straight opening drives without a touchdown. They've gone 10 without points. Um, they had you got to go back to the 11th drive to find a field goal in there. They've had nine straight opening drives. Uh, not nine of the last 10 have been punts and one's been a fumble. Um, that is, you can't ignore that anymore. Like you just can't. I mean, I, Adam yep. Gase, we kind of, we kind of backed off of it a little last week cause he put up close to 500 yards uh, with, you know, with Brock Osweiler as his quarterback and, and beat a very good bears team at home, which I think, again, we saw the bears are a pretty decent team. They took Patriots to the wire today. Uh, so I, we, we took, let them off the hook, but like, I mean, again, these are the stats Steve Ross needs to be looking at. Like, this is your offensive guru. Why are they so bad at the beginning of games every single time? And today it wasn't just the first drive. It was the first three drives. Um, Mm -hmm. Whatever he's designing during the week is not working. And you can't look. Wilson and Stills were healthy for the first drive. Um, He had both his running backs. And you come off a game in which you let up zero sacks against Chicago. You mentioned sack on that opening drive. Let up four sacks today against a, a, a Lions team without Ziggy Ansah, who was meant to kind of be, uh, if he comes back, then they'll look a lot better. And this is a Lions pass rush that is not, we talk about the Dolphins, it's not like Detroit is very good in this area either uh, in terms of getting sacks. So I, 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 I just don't, I don't understand how this happens again, how, how the offensive line flares up again, how they go three drives without moving the ball. Well, and I now, understand now, now that. You just I, I understand it. the offensive line flaring up because let's be honest. I mean, and Larson got hurt at the end of the game too, so that's not ideal. I, I, th- I think Davis did too. Uh, Davis, yeah, Davis did also, and that's not good. Um, so look, their, the, the their line, injury report might require two pages. And, oh, it's ridiculous. Um, all right, it, it, it's it's well, maybe the NFL will investigate that. One thing on that, by the way, how is it the Patriots are never investigated for their injury report? <laughs> the Dolphins basically fibbed, uh, okay, allegedly fibbed, okay, about how much Tannehill practiced one day, and the NFL is looking into it. I mean, that that one to yeah. me is, is Tom Brady's I, been I, questionable I, for a decade. Right. So I, I've kind of banged on the Dolphins for being like sort of uh, ridiculously evasive. Like when Gay said this week that Tadil could throw if he wants to. What? Like he could throw if he wants to? Like yeah. what, what is that? But but 32 that NFL st- teams are clandestine about it. Well, I, I think well, I shouldn't say that. I think Mike Tomlin starts every press conference with like a reading out of the injury. Yes, report. he does. No, yeah. no, he, he okay, does. Yeah. He does. And it hasn't hurt them. But um, but with that said, I, I can understand why if you're the Dolphins, you're like, man, we just want to play games on this one time and we get caught. 
and uh, and and the Patriots have been playing games since Belichick took over in what 2000. Um, I, so I, I can understand their frustration there, but. I guess, look, they need to be better at the beginning of games with whoever they have. Sure. The offense, the offensive line, uh, for that, I'm not blaming them. Like, them giving up four sacks with what they've had to piece together, I, I'm not going to kill them for that. I mean, the problem is they're running stuff at the beginning of games that's not working. Now, why isn't it working? Um, is it personnel or is it – because this is – you can't – 17 straight games without a touchdown to start a game, that's more than a full season. I mean, they've had four different quarterbacks mm-hmm. during that time, right? Cutler – five, actually, if you include Fails, right? So, no, I'm sorry. Did well, Fails start? No, no, this? Fails, fails Cut, didn't start. Started. Cutler started, but Fails played, basically played the whole game. All right, but Cutler started that game. So you're talking – you're talking uh, Tannehill, Cutler, Moore, and Osweiler. They've had four – none of them are Brady or Rodgers or Montana, but they've had four – Enough to get a touchdown. In 17 <laughs> games. Yeah, no, it, it's ridiculous. Uh, and, and you'd think that, now obviously you coaches put together an entire game plan, but the one possession you spend the most time on in the week is the first one, right? It's the one where right. you script the plays, where, all right, we're going to come out and we think we can do this. I mean, unless he's playing some four-dimensional chess in which he's, in, you know, intentionally, intentionally calling plays sport? that and intentionally calling plays that he's not actually, you know, planning on running but wants the other team to think that that's their game plan, then okay, I, I guess that's, you know, maybe well, a four-dimensional I, chess we're not yeah. aware of. But other than that, I mean, it's just been poor. And, and it doesn't make sense given – that I think that times Gase's offense looked pretty good within games, and it just it, the fact that he's I I still believe that he's really smart and knows how to call plays, but for whatever reason the first ones never seem to work. No, they don't. And I, the four dimensional chess thing is interesting, but I would believe that if you were seeing looks early in games, yeah. that then they were running something different out of those like, same. Like I've heard Be- I've heard Belichick does a thing where like. In garbage time, he'll intentionally put out personnel that he does not yes. plan on running, so that when other t- oh they're in thirty-one personnel this number of time, and he's just doing it at the end of the game just to basically bleep with the other teams trying to game plan. Like I like there are teams that do things like that, so I'm not saying it's entirely out of their own possibility, but. I think Adam Case wants to score every time the team touches the ball. Every time the team touches the ball, I don't think he's intentionally trying to put the other team off. No, and, and look, Belichick does a lot of things uh, that are to set up for later. Like they don't. Like one of the things when you talk to players that come out of the Patriots uh, system, most of them won't talk. I think for fear of being shot. But like, but <laughs> but the one, the, but the, the ones, who, the ones who do tell you anything. I mean, I, obviously, you and I are both close with with Leroy Horde, and and I've had this conversation with Leroy. Like Belichick won't put in new stuff during the season until he feels something is mastered. Okay. Like he, so a lot of times what happens with the Patriots is they'll come out of camp and they get off to slow starts. And it's because he's not really unleashing the entire playbook at that stage. Like he wants to be mastered and the Patriot teams always get better always as the year goes on. Um, And that's why, again, you look at the Patriots now, you're like, okay, you had to extend the lead off them now, right now. They lost Sony Michelle today. I don't know how bad that is, but he's on my fantasy team and I've already lost. I've already lost. The only reason you know that. Well, I've I've already lost Fournette and Dalvin (laughs) Cook. Those are my three backs. So I'm sure he's out for the season and probably several more um, because it's a keeper league. But uh, but look, they've lost players. They didn't have Gronk today. Right. They didn't have Edelman for the first four weeks because of the suspension. They just brought in Josh Gordon and he contributed today. And yet they're ahead of the Dolphins again. And scored 38 points in Chicago today. Right. Um, and so if I guess the thing you've got to say is, look, if Steve Ross has been looking for the guy to compete with Belichick in this division, maybe he still hasn't found it. Yep. Uh, you know, and, and the only guy that it might have been was 2005. And, you know, maybe with Nick, if he had. I don't know if he'd overruled his own doctors or whatever. They've gone with Breeze. Maybe we're having a different conversation, but but it hasn't happened. There, and there, there I, are more reasons. I, I, I do understand the revisionist history of it, but there were more reasons why that didn't work beyond they picked the wrong quarterback. Oh, no, like, no. There, he, there was, he just wasn't a fit for the NFL, was he? Well, no, he, he wasn't, and his wife hated it here. Um, and, and, he, and, look, he couldn't control a lot of things the way he couldn't control the players the way he could when he was not paying. Well, Allegedly not paying them in college, uh, he he could he couldn't he couldn't control the media, um, you know the way that he could in a in a college town. It's just different. Right. Uh, so there were a lot of things. I mean, he he couldn't control you know the you know the secretary saying he had a nice haircut. Like there were a lot of things he couldn't control uh, at this level, and he didn't like any of it. And and his family just never took to South Florida. 
So a lot of things played into it. But the single biggest thing was I think he would have stuck it out if he had a quarterback. Like he just didn't feel right. he had a quarterback. And if he felt like he had the breeze that we've seen now, with that said, I don't know, and this is a whole different pod. It's probably 12 other pods, but I don't know if uh, Breeze becomes in Miami what he does in New Orleans because I don't think that Nick Saban as an offensive mind is Sean Payton, and I, I don't know that the system would have been created for Drew Breeze uh, the way that it was uh, in New Orleans. So uh, everything might have been different. That was a, a lot of things came together in New Orleans. Like the, the, I mean, you had the hurricane, everybody – Drew became like a star of the town. I mean, it's just a bunch of different stuff. They had really good players around him too. Uh, Marcus Colston was underrated. Just a lot of – they had a lot of players that were good on those teams. So – but back to this. Uh, the question is, is Adam Gase the guy? And I just don't know that we've discovered that in any way this year. And it is one of the reasons why I do think – they're going to stay with Osweiler as long as possible because I think that Gase has to divorce himself from Tannehill. And yep. I know that Channing on our pod said they're married. They can't be divorced. You can't let Gase pick another quarterback. I don't think the owner will see it that way necessarily. Um, if and and I, I think I think a lot of people I think a lot of people imagine if this relationship was going to break up that it would break up because Ryan Tannehill would be bad enough for the Dolphins to go 4 and 12 or 5 and 11 and it just looks like a disaster. The the one thing about beating Chicago at home when no one expects you to do it is that the, those are kind of job saving wins and allow you the room to say okay, maybe it doesn't look good now, but there's enough there that makes me want to carry on. So mm-hmm. I, I think th- if there was a way for there to be a clean break between Gase and Tannehill with Gase remaining and not Tannehill, it's winning enough without Ryan Tannehill yes. that it allows you to make that decision. Right, exactly. And, and but again, if 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 Ross is paying attention, not scoring a touchdown on 17 straight opening drives with four different quarterbacks, two of which he brought in. Mm-hmm. One of which was extended on his watch. Not great. Not yeah, great. Agreed. Um, and, and so I, I think that I said it all along. They they need to win like eight or nine games this year at the very least for Adam Gase to be looked at as the coach going forward. I, I just I I don't think they have to win eleven. Then that's not going to happen now. I don't I don't you know I had him at eight before the season. Um, I, I think if they get eight or nine, you know, then I think it's okay. You know, we had a ton of injuries. We made progress. We added some good young players. We're going to figure out the quarterback situation. We're going to figure out the linebacker situation. We're going to get another year of Minka, uh, you know, becoming, you know, sort of emerging as a star uh, and all of those different things. We played two young defensive tackles to replace Sue. Like Tunsil made progress. There's a lot of things they can look at and say, okay, there's progress being made. But if this thing plunges to six and ten, and they don't, and the offense continues to be bad at the beginning of games, I think Steve Ross got to take a serious, serious look at it. Hey, Drew. So October is here, and in my mind, that means only one thing: it is almost time for my favorite event of the year. And no big surprise, but it's an OJ McDuffie party. Hey, you know it, Big Seth. The 17th annual Signature Grand Ghoul, presented by Calvin Giordano and Associates, will take place on Monday, October 29th, and once again benefits 211 Broward, an amazing charity. We are transforming the Signature Grand into a 100,000 square foot mansion for the sickest Halloween costume party in South Florida. And this costume party is for the grown folk, Big not people. the kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're talking open bar, amazing food, dancing, silent auction, and of course, contests and prizes for the most incredible costumes. And since the fish tank will be all up in the ghoul, as will a bunch of other hosts from our Five Reasons Sports family, let's do a little something special for the listeners. So what we need you to do is post a photo in your all-time greatest Halloween costume, tag your favorite Five Reasons Sports podcast, and use the hashtag DiveIntoTheGhoul. And the top four costumes will have a chance to win two tickets to the Signature Grand Ghoul on that October 29th. For more information on how you can join OJ and me at the Signature Grand Ghoul, visit 211-Broward.org and call 954-390-0493 and ask for Tracy. All right, real quick here, part five. We've already declared this a loss for this Thursday, not because of anything on the field, but because we're having a watch party. But <laughs> but give give me give me one thing, Chris, that needs to happen for them to beat Houston. Uh, I would say their offensive line is probably the worst in football, uh, even worse than the Dolphins. I think a lot of Dolphins fans might be surprised to know there are other bad offensive lines, but Houston's is appalling. Like, universally, they came into the season, and I think through three or four games, I was listening to the Pro Football Focus podcast, and they were uh, saying that the Texans' offensive line was on a record-setting pace in terms of allowing pressure. So if there's going to be a game in which Dolphins' defensive ends can get off and get a few sacks at Deshaun Watson, I would say you mentioned the fact they've won four in a row, and I was surprised to hear you say that. Uh, Within the last three wins, 
It's been uh, 20 points against Jacksonville, 20 points against Buffalo, and 19 points against Dallas in an overtime game, and then scored a bunch at Indianapolis against a team that had almost as many injuries as the Dolphins do now. So Mm -hmm. I I would say it's just the fact that their offense is not very good, and you have to – kind of put the clamps on them you need you know a d- defensive players to be a bit healthier than they were today you need a more cogent game plan uh, they are not I-, I would say the Lions are a pretty proficient offense particularly in games that they've won I think you know, if you include the 32 today they're averaging somewhere around 29 30 points a game in-, in games that they've won so when they're rolling they can be a really good offense but I, I would say that that the, that, that the Houston offense is not particularly good, and if there's going to be the thing that the Dolphins can do to beat them, it's going to be to limit them, and maybe you score 21 on the road, uh, scrap together some victories. But we've seen in primetime games on short weeks, this Dolphins it, 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 games can get away from the Dolphins. Yeah. It, they can wilt fairly quickly. And I would just say the biggest hope out of that is that at least it's competitive in the fourth quarter and you're not getting mm-hmm. destroyed. Yeah, no, and I think it's on the Dolphin defense here. I, I'm kind of with you on that. They they need to keep Deshaun Watson uh, in the pocket as much as possible. I mean, that's obviously... Like, Watson's last two games, he had 139 yards today and 177 in his last one. Like, he is certainly... He's not playing, he's you not can limit him. Level he, well, he's not playing at the level he did before the injury last year. I, yeah. I, I think what we've seen with him is that typically that it takes a year... Uh, to a year and a half to kind of get back to that point. He's been fine. He's been good enough mm-hmm. with what they have defensively, but he hasn't been great. But yeah, they need, look, they need to get in his face. They need to the pressure. And and this goes back to if Wake is healthy uh, and Quinn seems to be healthy, uh, if those two, uh, they, they need to be dynamic. Uh, this is, that's where it starts for this defense um, is on the ends. And if they're not, they just have too many holes at the linebacker positions uh, defensive tackle, which is still, I, I've liked what those guys have done for the most part this season, but still a bit of a work in progress. Um, it, it that's that's all going to be problematic uh, for them. And obviously, look, Houston's got an elite guy on the outside. Now you hope that uh, that Xavier Howard, you know, can get back. It's been weird with Xavier Howard. He plays better against better receivers. I, I don't I don't know why that's happening. There there are some re- corners that that's just the case with, but. He's had some of his best performances against guys that you would consider mm-hmm. closer to elite. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's that guys are like you- matchup games where like I'm going to this game and I've got right. DeAndre Hopkins and I've got right. you know uh, whomever a- a- AJ Green. Yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, so uh, he, they they've done he's done he's done a pretty good job on those kind of guys on on Julio Jones on others. But when when you get into some of these guys that mm-hmm. you know, again you've never heard of third fourth receivers, um, there's been some problems. Anyway, check out our watch party Thursday night Township. Fort Lauderdale. Um, that is, if you're not sure, familiar with what it is, it's it's basically right on the back end of Riverfront or what Riverfront used to be, uh, right on the corner of Las Solas and Andrews. We're going to get out there starting at about seven o'clock. We've got nineteen dollar buckets um, all night long. Uh, we've also uh, they've got all kinds of Stein specials. Um, they've got twenty percent off appetizers and pretzels the entire night. Uh, it's a great spot, actually. It's right where, if you're not familiar with where it is, it's where Tilted Kilt was for about a couple of years. Oh, okay. Uh, right there. Yeah, see, now you know where to go. Well, you won't be going, probably. Well, you've I'll, got, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be arriving late. You, you'll, you'll be arriving late halftime. But for, for people who have complained that we've done too many of these on the weekends and they can't leave the families and all that stuff, um, yeah, just say you're going to Las Olas. The wife will love that. Anyway, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk to you soon. This is the Five Reason Sports Network, Miami Sports On Demand. We now have 13 podcasts in the network posting roughly 15 times per week, all absolutely free. Find all of our shows on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Podbean. Plus, become a member of our patron feed and you'll get even more fresh content. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Here's some of what you missed last week on Cinco Razones when they talked to George Sedano. No, están frustrados, no, yo lo entiendo, yo entiendo. Y, y Pat Riley también está frustrado. <laughs> Van ya dos veces que le ha colgado el teléfono a Tom Thibodeau y le ha dicho que se vaya para el carajo. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get involved as a sponsor or a contributor, reach out to us at number five Reason Sports on Twitter. Don't forget to punch five reasons in your search bar and then hit subscribe.